we, we started off with this topic at Tech for Africa last year with Andy Budd from Clear Left, who came and did a cool talk on it, um, on user experience design, and, and kind of got the conversation going. And, and I know this is one of the most anticipated talks that we've got, so it's nice that we're leading with it today. Um, we've got Kenneth and James here from Clear Left. They've come out from the UK to come and chat to us. They're, they're um, accomplished authors of Undercover User Experience Design, and, um, and they're here to talk about the march of the UX designers. And, it's, and we were chatting last night at, at the function around how UX is often an underappreciated art because people only notice it when they get it when you get it wrong. When you get it right, users don't know and they don't acknowledge it. So, um, so but it's good to see that all you guys are appreciating it. So, without further ado, I'm going to hand over um, Kenneth and James. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Um, first time in Africa for, for both me and Kenneth. It's a real privilege to be here and uh, really, really nice to see so many people come here this morning. Um, so we're going to be talking about the March of the UX designers. Um, I'm James. This is Kenneth. Well done for getting his name right. I don't think his tweet handle is quite the same, but uh, nearly there. So <laughs> double D. Yeah. yeah, so March of the UX designers. <clears throat> so I want to start with a few questions. Everyone wants to know the secret of, of certain companies. Why is it in the last few years that Apple's stocks have risen, whereas some of their competitors like Research in Motion, the makers of the BlackBerry, have fallen? Why is it that, that certain companies have disrupted entire sectors, not just in mobile and IT? How is it that someone like Netflix has managed to push traditional video rental stores to the verge of bankruptcy? What about Zipcar? They've made the entire car hire business sit up and pay attention. And we think the answer is that these people have set up their entire business around their customers. They've truly understood their customers and designed easy to use enjoyable services for them. The age of competing simply on features is over. And what makes you stand out now is your experience. And a good experience is happy customers. And happy customers means loyalty. To support this approach, uh, a community of practice has, has sort of risen up. And this, this community of practice calls itself user experience design, and it's a community that Kenneth and I have both been part of for the last decade or so. But before we talk about UX design specifically, let's try and find out where it came from, how it came into being. <clears throat> and what better place to start than the humble potato peeler? Now, whether we like it or not, the potato peeler is a, a successful product. We know that successful products, are respective of whether they're digital or analog products, have similar characteristics, characteristics like these. Useful, usable, desirable. It's affordable to the right people. It's sensitive to the context in which it's used, the environment in which it's used. But products rarely begin life in this way. <laughs> they tend to evolve over time. So this is, uh, does anyone recognize this? Yeah, it's ENIAC. Yeah, so this is one of the world's first computers, probably the first computer. This, this thing occupied 3,000 uh, cubic feet. It weighed about 30 tons, had about 18,000 vacuum tubes in it. And you can forget about zettabytes. <laughs> this had one kilobit of memory. So that's about the same kind of processing power as a kind of musical birthday card. <clears throat> Now, ENIAC, of course, was designed. Someone designed it. But this is very much a design in the engineering sense. The goals of those designers were very much to make this a faster, bigger machine with more computational power than ever before. And really, there was no consideration to that relationship between the man or woman operating it and the machine itself. So in order to operate these early computers, data was entered into the machines using things called punch cards. And this uh, com compiling a punch card, this was very much the domain of a specialist. We're very much in the realm here of the operator having to learn the language of the machine to use it. We have to adapt to the constraints of that actual device. But punch cards evolve too. This is the porter punch. It's the punch card equivalent of a mobile or a smartphone. It's clearly the direct inspiration for the iPhone, I think. <laughs> <coughs> but, you know, we joke, but this is really about context. We're still speaking the language of the machine, but we're offered to do it in a kind of more convenient way. Let's skip forward to 1970. This is the IBM 3270 fans. So this is just a, a dumb terminal, really, uh, a sort of non-programmable workstation. 
Um, basically, you've got a screen and a keyboard. This, this terminal had kind of basic communications capabilities. It was text-based. It had 12 rows and 80 columns of text characters. But we have a keyboard. We have an input device. And eventually, we start to see computing spilling out into, out of science, out of engineering, into the home market. So this is the Altair, which was sort of one of the most successful first home computers. It was a, a kit thing. You, you basically ordered this and built it yourself at home. There's no keyboard or monitor that's cheaply available for it, though. So, so really, when users initially used this, they had to flip switches on the front panel, write their own programs in machine language, and watch the LEDs on the front panel light up in response to their commands. That's all it did. <laughs> but this was, this, was, this was really popular. You know, going back to the qualities of successful products I showed, this is about context. This could be used at home, and now it was affordable, too. So eventually we start to see a shift away from users just operating machines and we start to see software that's designed to perform a task. So VisiCalc. VisiCalc was basically very primitive spreadsheet software. It ran on the Apple II. But it's really, you know, if you look at it, I don't know if you can see it, it's really not that far removed from the layout that we see in something like Excel today. And just look how empowered this guy is. Look how confident he is with his VisiCalc software. <clears throat> Personal software. <clears throat> so what's crucial here is that strong is that there's a strong commercial concept to, context to user friendliness. Visicals, Visicals success was actually superseded by uh, something called Lotus One Two Three, and it was largely down to the thinking around this guy Mitch Kapoor. So this started to be used in large companies. It led to an emphasis uh, on ease of learning, ease of use, reduced errors, save time. And in his book, The Software Design Manifesto, Mitch Kapoor really clearly articulated this idea that making useful, usable, delightful software is a design problem and not just an engineering one. So again, we move back into the home when the Mac designed the computer for the rest of us. The Super Bowl commercial in 1984, if anyone's seen it, was clearly designed to hint at this shift away from the task-orientated complexity of commercial machines towards the home user improving their lives. And the success speaks for itself, usability now being seen as a business advantage. Now, I'm sure Steve will be mentioned uh, many times during the next couple of days, but away from the, re the rhetoric and away from the spin, I think it's hard to deny the fact that Apple's products have made people's lives richer and more meaningful. Controls that we use now are no longer sort of mapped to the guts of the machine with switches and lights. We now use simple, familiar, intuitive gestures to control our devices. And we're starting to see the input device being replaced with something like voice in Siri. But this is what it's really all about. It's about huggable technology. This is a woogie. This is a teddy bear that it has an embedded iPhone in it. Now we can hug our computers. This is what it's all about. <clears throat> but emotional factors are important. Brand people have understood this for a very, very long time, and we're catching up. They understand that we form emotional connections with products around us. They understand that the products are sophisticated and intelligent, but they're ingrained within our daily lives. We have dialogues with them, we trust them, and some people would even argue we have a relationship with them. This guy knows this. This is Stephen P. Anderson, a friend of ours. He's also the author of a book called Seductive Interaction Design, which I highly recommend. And Stephen maps this journey from the bottom here, from tasks to experience using this hierarchy. And if we look back on this evolution of computing, it's easy to see how the computers have climbed this hierarchy from the basic function and reliability of any act right through to the kind of pleasurable, pleasurable meaningful connections that many of us have with iPhones and iPads. I think it's important to note that Stephen rightly points out that you really can't have this top part of the pyramid without all the elements that precede it. So user experience design as it is today has become a discipline that's really hit the mainstream. Um, and as, as, as happens often when, that, when you, you have mainstream adoption of something, perhaps you even go too far and people start to muddy the waters as to what this, this discipline actually is. So let's have a look at it uh, in, a bit more, in a bit more detail. Really, user experience design is an umbrella term. It's a discipline that contains other disciplines. 
uh, design research, information architecture, interaction design, uh, usability, content strategy, and so on. Now, it's, this isn't an exact science. The exact definitions and what's in and what's out, clearly that varies depending on who you talk to. But generally, there are a couple of different ways that you can approach the field. So if we see user experience as this overarching umbrella term, the number of disciplines within it, it's possible, for instance, to go deeper in one particular uh, specialization. In this case, it could be information architecture. And then you'd be a specialist in that particular field. This is what's known as the T-shaped uh, model or the T-shaped person who has depth in one particular area, but a bit of breadth in the related disciplines that also go hand in hand with IA. A user experience generalist is someone who has reasonable depth in all of the facets of the uh, user experience field. And this is the sort of model that we see quite a lot in, uh, in agencies, for instance. So the point behind all this really is that user experience is a broad discipline. Uh, and it's right, I think, that it, it has that breadth. Because if we think of all of the things that could have an influence on the end user's experience, that's a pretty diverse set of technological and design challenges that, that, that have that kind of impact. So now we're starting to realize the scale of the work we have to do. It does mean that we have to see it as a natural part of the way that we build and design products. It's not something we can just tack on at the end. As Liz Danzico said, uh, says here, user experience design isn't a checkbox. You don't just do it and move on. It, it needs to be integrated into everything that you do. Absolutely right. So user experience practitioners are now getting involved right at the start of projects, at the strategy and the purpose. What is it we're building and why and for whom? Through to release and beyond of the product. So it's starting to find its place, uh, find a natural home within businesses. And you see many, well, uh, uh, many successful web and mobile and tech companies that have established user experience design departments. And we start to see, of course, the career paths and the levels of seniority uh, come from, from part of that. So it's becoming recognized as an important part of product design. But generally, the way that these companies have built these innovative things and seen the rewards from that is through a design process, uh, a, a particular number of steps that put the user at the heart of what they're building. And here are the four kind of rough stages of the user-centered design uh, process. And what we'll do today is go quickly through them in turn, um, talking about what you guys can do today to bring, uh, bring forth better experiences for the users of your products. We'll start with design research. Somewhat counterintuitively, the user experience design process begins with a pause. To design for people, we really first have to understand people. It can be therefore premature to dive into designs until we know exactly what questions we're trying to answer. Now, design research is one of these things that I think is quite easy to misunderstand. Um, there's a, an old uh, quote that's attributed to Henry Ford um, he didn't actually say it, but I'm sure many of you have heard it. Uh, if I'd have asked my customers what they wanted, they would have asked for a faster horse. Design research isn't about listening to a wish list of features. It isn't just going to a customer and saying, what do you want, and then giving it to them. It's really about understanding their behaviors, the language they use when talking about the problem, their mental models, how do they conceive of that problem, how do they understand it, and what approaches do they currently take? So really what we're trying to do here is learn more about how we, as designers, can solve that problem for them. And we're looking for opportunities to innovate and to meet the desires of the users, perhaps even ones that they don't know how to give voice to themselves. Now, on a first glance, um, a lot of people look at this and say, well, this is quite similar to market research, right? And yes, there certainly are similarities. But market research is, is generally more opinion-driven. It's uh, you know, responses to a particular brand approach or a marketing message, for instance, and it's generally aggregated, so you get sort of large-scale sort of data stuff. Design research is generally more behavioral. So what we're looking at is what actually drives people? What are their motivations? How do they tackle individual challenges? What are the tasks involved? And as a result, it's quite individual. It's quite sp uh, specific. So when you're looking at the design research you have available, by all means, do look at your market research data. You'll have some great stuff in there, but usually you'll find you'll need to extend that with your own more detailed uh, design research. And this is actually extremely easy to get started with. Uh, again, research has this reputation for being a bit of a bottleneck, being a, a, a lot of work, but if, particularly if you have an existing product, you can get started in this in, in literally just a couple of hours. 
So you can uh, start by something called an expert review. And this is really just a run through, a structured appraisal of your existing website or app or product or whatever it is that you have using particular heuristics or rules of thumb. And these are seven that we use, that we've adapted from other, other sort of different sources. And really all you need to do here is step through your product from first principles and say, well, how, how tailored to humans is it? Does it actually use human language or does it use computer terminology? Is it forgiving, accessible? Is it self-evident, predictable, efficient, trustworthy? Going through this is going to take you about two hours. Um, and already, just from that, you'll have a fantastic understanding from first principles of what that experience might be like for the first-time user. So this may feel kind of like an artificial way to understand the experience you're offering, but it's a really great way to analyze your site against tested design principles. And you can extend this sort of thing as well. So you don't just need to look at your own services, you can look at competitors as well. So we get this kind of competitive analysis. Now, this is a great conversation starter within business, right? I mean, nothing gets people more excited than what the other guy's doing. Um, there's a risk there that I think that we get a bit too hung up on that. As a designer, I'm interested in what competitors are doing, but I don't want to fixate on it, because if we're always trying to chase their tails, we're never going to be able to pull ahead uh, from them. Of course, you need to spend time looking at your analytics, and I'm sure most of you, you do this as well, because they tell you what people are actually doing on your site or in your app. So you can look particularly at certain routes, uh, conversion funnels, particular navigation paths, and so on. But again, it's easy to put a bit too much weight on this stuff, um, because it's hard data, right? We all love hard data. But the problem is that metrics will tell you what is happening, and they'll never tell you why it's happening. So for instance, if someone's spending a long time on your website, that could be because they're completely stuck and they can't find what they're looking for, or it could be simply they're enjoying it and they're just clicking around learning more things. So I liken metrics to a crying baby. You know, it, it, you're in no doubt that something is wrong, but you're left to your own devices to figure out what the problem actually is. So really you need to talk to people to find out actually how they work. So a few methods that you can use to bring design research into your, into your, into your own business. Um, the first is a very simple technique. It's just interviewing, just literally talking to your customers. Face-to-face um, -face is great if you can do that, but you can also do it over the phone. You can do it through instant messaging and so on, or Skype or whatever it might be. And in, in an interview, what you're really trying to do is ask these open-ended questions and let the, the user, the participant, drive the conversation. You're trying to learn from them. You don't want simple tick box answers. You want to understand more, again, about the language and the way they approach things and their hopes and fears and dreams and all these, these wonderful things. So you can steer these interviews in interesting directions. You can also try focus groups. These aren't regarded particularly highly uh, by the design community um, because they can, be, um, they, can, they can succumb to groupthink. So if you have a particularly dominant person in the room, they can sometimes skew the views of others. But if you need a whole lot of opinions... Um, you know, in a relatively short space, this can be an effective way to find out how people conceive of the product you're building or the space you're trying to address. You can also send out very simple questionnaires, things like that. Obviously, these are great for lots of numerical data, if you need statistical significance, that kind of thing. I always try and back this up with the face-to-face -face stuff, though, as well, to try and get some of that human story behind the data. Or you may choose to do something called a diary study, and this is... Um, uh, this is where you ask people to record their interactions with a particular product or service or maybe even just uh, when they uh, encounter advertising or something like that. They record those interactions over a long period. It might be a week, a month, and so on. And so that way you can track how their expertise changes with time, for instance. Now, when it comes to these kind of research, me research methods, there is no right approach. Really, this is a toolkit right, that you can pick the correct tool for the job, the right approach for what you're trying to do. But it's surprisingly easy to get started with this kind of thing. Um, you can get hold of participants by asking your existing customers. Ask your friends if they're representative of the type of people who are using the service. Uh, you can ask, obviously, members of the public as well. Uh, it helps, obviously, if you can offer an incentive. Uh, discounts are good for existing customers. They tend to like that sort of stuff. Gift certificates and, of course, you know, hard cash works quite nicely too. But it's also really useful to be able to watch someone actually using your service. Can I just ask a, a quick poll? Can you put your hand up if in the last month um, you've actually watched someone use your product? That's a lot more than I was expecting. That's fantastic. But you know, we still should have more, more hands in the room. That was probably about a quarter. 
Um, and for me, it's the simplest and the most valuable way that you can learn about the experience that you're offering uh, your users. So you can run a quick and dirty usability test, and we'll talk about those a little bit later. But this, uh, this so-called corridor test, it's cool because you can just drag someone into a corridor in your office, right, and just say, hey, I'm trying this out. Test it, see what you think. So you can grab you know, a friend, member of family, grab the receptionist, someone who doesn't use the service very frequently, and just watch, you know, how do they actually use the application? What, what problems are there? And the first time you do this, you'll be surprised um, at the things that you never realized were, were a problem. Even better is to do this kind of thing in the user's natural uh, environment. So, I mean, particularly Africa has very diverse use cases, uh, particularly if we compare it to Europe, which is much more sort of desktop and office based, right? So, you know, get out there, do some field research and actually see how people are using your technology in their daily lives. It can be extremely uh, revealing. So what we're doing with research is really building up a good body of knowledge about our users and who they are and what they're trying to do. But we need to share this knowledge with the rest of the team. So we need to build these into some kind of output. I firmly believe that a big report just isn't the right approach to present design research. I mean, the user-centered mindset is meant to be a new and refreshing way to look at the world. So I think that mentality has to carry through to the artifacts that, that we produce. So sure, you can present your quantitative data, your surveys, usability test uh, studies, you know, success rates, and so on. You can display these as numerical data and chart them up and all that sort of stuff. But Really, for me, design research is about looking for ways to bring people to life within a project team. So you might choose to use something called a persona. Uh, now, a persona is really just a, a, a fictitious user um, that represents a typical user group. And you'll notice here, uh, this, this lady, we can't read it that well, but she's got a, a, obviously a face, uh, a real photograph, not a stock image. Um, she's got a name, she's got an age, an occupation. And this goes beyond demographics as well. We're also talking in the narrative on the left here about her hopes and her goals and why she's using this service. So there are two reasons why you might want to use uh, a persona. The first is that for designers, it's a lot easier to design something for this person than it is for a whole heap of data, a whole heap of sort of uh, you know, market segmentation or whatever it might be. The second is this, this persona then can act as a common reference point for everyone in the organization. So everyone has an opinion on design, right? It's just inescapable. Um, one of the great things about personas is if you're having one of these debates where you're just not making any headway, you can really step into the user's shoes and say, well, it doesn't really matter what you and I think. What does Bethan think? How is she going to attack, uh, attack this problem? Will she understand the design that we're trying to create here? So you can extend the idea of personas into posters and postcards and really anything that makes them a bit more memorable. Um, a bit more human, something you can just glance at and remember the story of the real person that you're trying to build something for. And then you can extend this further into things like comics and storyboards. And what these do is they'll show how people will interact with technology in their daily lives. So you're not just limiting your focus to their, their tight interaction with the site itself or with the app itself. How does it fit into the broader pattern um, of, of their lives? So all these techniques, these design techniques, uh, research techniques, they, they really don't need to take long. I mean, even a week spent on design research, I think, will give uh, you know, really valuable results. And research can generate fantastic uh, discussion. It's going to help you to challenge the assumptions that you've made. It will also give you a greater confidence in the direction that your designs are going in. And it's going to help you recognize innovative ways to design your own products. So, where are we now? Uh, we're excited, we've got lots of information, we're maybe a little daunted, we understand our users, we understand the domain they're operating in, and it's really tempting at this stage to jump straight in and try to start solving these problems for these users. We're now really familiar with these things, and we've, we've probably glimpsed solutions, things that we could, uh, could start designing right away, and we're problem solvers, we're designers, that's what we want to do. But I think this quote from the chess player, Emmanuel Lasker, really demonstrates why we shouldn't necessarily be so hasty at this point. He says, when you see a good move, look for another one. And this is what this generating ideas phase is all about. This stage of the process represents a sort of really unique opportunity for us to kind of explore the possibility space around the project we're working on. 
So it's at this stage that we start to open out the number of design possibilities before narrowing down on the right one further down the process. <clears throat> and why not? I mean, at this stage of the project, the risks are really low. We don't have to hold on to anything at this point. We haven't built anything. There's nothing to change. Our goal is really to give ourselves a broad range of ideas to pick from and avoid sort of being tempted to fixate on those obvious solutions which crop up right at the start of the project. What this does is give us this, this range of perspective. Essentially, we want to diverge before we converge at the end of a project. But divergent thinking can feel sort of unnatural, especially after we've uh, worked so hard to try and establish what the problems are and who we're trying to solve them for. And it really doesn't come easily to everyone to think in this way, and it has to be sometimes learned. The good news is we can encourage this kind of thinking. Uh, Edward de Bono's book, The Six Thinking Hacks, really acknowledged the fact that we can manufacture the conditions for this kind of divergent or generative thinking to occur. It doesn't mean that ideas have to be the domain of the creative department. <clears throat> and the ad industry have known about these techniques for a long time. This is a great book by James Webb Young, uh, an ad guy, a technique for producing ideas. And it's really based on the very simple premise that, that new concepts are often, uh, often result from us simply just recombining a range of previously existing ideas. Some of these might sound ridiculous. I mean, blogging with 140 characters, who would have thought that would have got Twitter where they are now? So sketching, sketching is the perfect medium for this, this level of thinking for me. It's a, it's a very simple tool, and we use it to, to, to capture and explore this plethora of ideas. It's probably the tool, to be honest, that I rely on more heavily than anything else, any piece of software in my day-to-day -day work. You know, it's got a very, very low barrier to entry. We've always got a pen and paper near us. Um, it's quick. We can do something really, really quickly and get some, express an idea with, with no hesitation. And crucially, these things, sketches are disposable. We don't get attached, then we can throw them away and start all over again, whereas a, a, a design that we've poured over, that we've put our heart and soul into, is easy to become too attached to. And it's fun as well. I really like telling my kids that I draw for a living. <laughs> but it's not about being an artist. Sketching is not about being an artist at all. It's not the quality of these sketches that's important whatsoever. It's about being able to express ideas in a sort of quick and efficient manner. And this is what Jason's trying to illustrate with this quote here. And it's important that we kind of banish this fear that I, kind of, I suck at drawing, I can't sketch. It's really not about that. It doesn't matter. And I'm always surprised at how many design problems can just simply be solved with a simple drawing and a conversation with someone sitting next to me. It's just kind of this sort of thing that we do on a daily basis. Very, very lo-fi, and intentionally so. We're, we're using kind of clumsy tools, like you know, big fat tip markers like Sharpies. And that's really to try and avoid thinking into too much detail, thinking about the broad brush strokes rather than the, the finer grain details. So here's an example from a project I worked on last year uh, in the UK for the Channel 4 news site. And then these kind of sketches were, were made very, long, very early on in the process, often in sort of group activities. And we produced a whole heap of ideas around different ways of navigating the site. And some of these things made their way eventually into the final product, albeit in a slightly different form. So this, this stage of the process is also a really good opportunity to start trying to build consensus on the project amongst the project team. So what I was saying about divergent thinking is that it, it benefits from as many perspectives as possible to create that divergence. So tapping into the brains of people with different skills, different disciplines, can be a real benefit. Um, a developer, for example, is going to think very, in a very different way to a marketing manager, and that's okay, and we want to encourage that kind of thinking. At the same time, collaborative design can be quite daunting. I'm sure we're all kind of painfully aware of that kind of design by committee feeling or the death by a thousand paper cuts. And we've all been there. But managed properly, this can be a really rewarding part of the process. It can create a strong sense of ownership with the stakeholders on that project. There's this sense of catharsis. People who've worked around a product for a long time will always have pent up ideas and they're desperate to express them. And you want to hear those at the start of the project, not two months down the line when you realise that there was this burning, burgeoning idea which didn't get expressed at the start of the project. 
Again, we get this diversity that's so important for divergent thinking. And this sense of inclusion that people feel involved in the project from, from the start. It's not a them and us thing. There's not a design team thing and a manager thing. We're part of the same team. So what this, is, this picture is trying to illustrate here is something very simple, a technique that we use called a sketchboard. It's probably kind of one of the simplest things that we use. It's pretty much what it looks like. Uh, but it's really, really effective at building consensus on a project. This is basically a large piece of paper stuck on the wall. And it's got all the current design thinking mounted in a sort of vaguely ordered manner. Nothing remarkable here, but in this project we're talking about things on the left here being sort of rough site maps. You can't really make it out, but these things were very rough kind of proto-personas that we've been working on. And some of the sketches that I showed earlier on are just appearing up here and starting to, to come, become visible on the project wall. And it's a subtle thing, but these kind of, um, this, kind of, this kind of sketchboard technique brings some great qualities to a project that help consensus. So visibility, we put this right at the heart of the space we were working in with the, with the client. So this was right next to the kitchen. People would walk past and see it all the time. It also really uh, pushed forward this idea of collaboration. We left post-it notes and Sharpies around the desk, as you can see, and it meant people felt enabled to contribute ideas whenever they wanted to, some better than others, but you know. <coughs> the thing I really like it for is it, it encourages kind of stand-up communication. So I, I know what it's like to try and resolve design disputes via email or via base camp or something along those lines. You're sending an email to another contact who has to look back through their attachments to find out the design that you're talking to, blah, blah, blah. And those kind of decisions are painful and take so long that it kind of lose the momentum on the project. With something like this, you can just literally pull people around that board and ask them the questions and resolve that in 10 minutes flat. And it's been really, really powerful for that. I think the intent is important here as well. We're using a, a specific vocabulary. We're using sketches. We're using things that are clearly not finished. We're inviting feedback from the other users, from the other stakeholders. So there's this sense of inclusion. Everyone sees what we're working on. There's no secrets. There's no hidden agenda going on. There's a, there's a very high level of visibility to what we're doing. And lastly, this is a really portable thing. It's very lo-fi, but you can literally attach this from the wall, roll it up, and take it into a meeting and start talking about the design thinking that's going on in the project at any one time. So what we're trying to do uh, at this stage, then, is we take the ideas that we've been working on so far. And in this third stage of detailed design, we explore the ones that work the best for the users and for the business. So a, a user experience designer here will typically look at what lies beneath the surface. So things like the structure, the format of the content, and how the, particularly how the system responds to user input. And historically, I think there's been this separation of, of user experience designers doing the kind of the structure, the skeleton, and the visual designers, the graphic designers, doing the surface, the, the typography, the colors, the grid, the brand, and so on. I think there's now a, a growing recognition that actually those, those need to be brought a bit closer. But the idea of this detailed design phase is that really, as James says, we're trying to get things wrong here rather than as we start building them. There's a wonderful quote from Frank Lloyd Wright, the architect, who says that you can either fix something on the drafting board with an eraser or you can fix it on the site with a sledgehammer. In this phase, we're also documenting the, the design choices that we've made because clearly we need to communicate them to other people on our team. So that might be copywriters, developers, marketers. Um, and let's not forget the, uh, the customer service people who are going to have to deal with the user inquiries about the changed design. Uh, this detailed design phase also helps you design, though. As you move towards a more formalized structure, you have to focus more on the detail. So these become almost living documents that, that edge closer and closer to the final thing. So what we'll do in a second is we'll have a look at some of the, the artifacts, some of the deliverables, as they're called, that user experience teams produce. But before we do that, let's just pause uh, with a caveat. Um, it's quite easy to fetishize deliverables, and I think the UX industry sometimes does that, because that's what we're recognized for. That's what we're known for, right? We're the person who creates the sitemap and the wireframe and the prototypes and whatever. So we're judged on those. But really, uh, as, as, as Keith Robinson says, the, the process and the act of creating a deliverable is, is far more important, really, than the deliverable itself. The, the piece of paper, the document, it's a step, it's a stop on the journey, but it's not the end of the line. 
So here's, here's one of the uh, deliverables that a, a user experience designer might produce. This is something that's called a concept map or a concept model. Um, it's a shame it hasn't come out all that well, but you can see what we've got is a series of nouns connected by arrows which contain verbs. So this is a concept map for Flickr. And you can see the general premise within Flickr that a user takes a photo of a subject, right? And the user can add a favorite, a photo can be favorited, and so on. Um, and really what we're trying to do here is we're trying to fully understand the entire domain about photography and sharing photos. Um, and this is a great way to ensure that you haven't missed any opportunities and also to clarify the language. I'm sure we've all been in those projects where you have to kind of stop halfway through and say, hang on, sorry, what exactly do you, do you mean by a landing page or a ranking page? Because I thought we meant this one. You kind of avoid that ambiguity if you do this kind of modeling up front. And you start to see very, very early, just right at this, you know, this, this kind of nascent stage, just, you know, this sort of maps quite nicely to how the site or the application might be structured. So it's pretty sensible to assume that Flickr is going to have a user page, a photo page, and a sub subject page. And the verbs might be the interactions that you can undertake on those pages. It starts to give you a good clue of how to shape that product. This is a sitemap. I'm sure many of you, well, all of you are familiar with a sitemap. It's a real kind of bread and butter deliverable um, that a UX designer will produce. Um, not terribly exciting visually, just lots of boxes and connecting lines and arrows. Really what we're doing here is representing the structure um, and the, the scope of the site or the application that we're building. It's a bit like um, how do the jigsaw pieces fit together, right? And how many jigsaw pieces are there in the first place? So this gives you a really uh, interesting insight into the scope of the project. And this is going to be particularly useful for big information heavy sites because each one of these pages is going to have to be not only designed and built, it's also going to have to be written. So this is very useful for working with your copywriters to say, well, here's the workload that we need. And they may push back and say, well, that's completely unrealistic. And you may have to revisit that. Sitemaps, though, they're not very good for process-driven stuff, for really interactive things. They're much better for hierarchical kind of info-driven sites. So you might instead, for a kind of very interactive application, do something like a storyboard or what's known as a wire flow. And this is kind of you know, like a flow chart or a, or a series of steps. It might be like a wizard, for instance, that people go through to complete data or fill in a, a long form or whatever it might be. The example we see here, it's still pretty sketchy, but we've got some annotations to say well, exactly what's happening in each of these states. And again, this is a, a, an artifact that we could hand to a developer if they're particularly... Uh, you know, if this is just a minor change on an existing page, for instance, or this is an artifact that we could take into a meeting and say, here's our proposed solution. How do we think this is going to work for our users? Uh, a kind of higher level of detail is the wireframe. Again, I'm sure almost all of you will be familiar with the wireframe. It's really a low detail representation of what's going to exist on an interface. So it's the content, what's there, how does it fit together, what's the rough layout, bits about the functionality, different states that that screen might take, uh, and therefore bits of behavior that go with that. So what responds to what input? Now, that can be quite difficult to capture um, in a static wireframe. If you've got a heavily interactive page, let's say we've got a you know, snazzy Ajax kind of uh, application or something that's really you know, kind of cutting edge, then a wireframe may not be that appropriate. So in situations like that, uh, you'll usually want to turn to a prototype. And prototypes obviously have the advantage that they work in real time, right? They respond to input. You can click around them. You can explore them. And as such, you get a real feel for how the application works that you don't get in paper and these other kind of deliverables. I think the way I look at it is they take the smallest leap of imagination to imagine what the final product is going to be like. So I find they're excellent for... Um, for senior stakeholders, um, who sometimes aren't that imaginative, I'm afraid. Um, but also, the, one of the great things is you can test with these. So if you built a prototype, you can then get some users in, or some you know, potential users, and see how they use it, and see whether the decisions you've made are ones that actually suit the way the user thinks about the problem. Now, of course, prototypes take you know, a bit more effort. They, you, know, you have to build these things and make sure you've got the content and all this sort of stuff. But in many cases, they really are worth uh, that time investment. It's still easier to fix something in a prototype than realize too late after you've started building the whole product that you've gone down the wrong route. So really, we're not worrying about the polish. We're not worrying about coding this the right way. Just get it up there and make sure that it works, that, that the finesse can come later in the process. 
At the, uh, the kind of the top end of this detail scale, I just want to talk about this. This is a functional specification. Um, this is just a detailed spec of how every element on a website or application works. You can imagine these are these are big documents. Now these are, shall we say, they're not ideal because um, by the time you've written it, then they'll usually have to change. Um, but there are some industries and some ways of working that still need this kind of real level of control. Um, and if that's if that's the case, then you know functional spec is still a good way uh, to get that kind of level of control passed down the line. So what I've shown is some really kind of structural artifacts, right? So it's it's the design that lies underneath the surface. But not every user experience person will be putting grey boxes around the place. Some of them will work better with sketches and pens and paper. Some of them are going to be much more comfortable opening up Photoshop or Fireworks and actually building something that's quite faithful to the, to the finished interface. It really depends on what the best fit is for your team. But the most important thing about all of these is that the design choices that are seen in these, in these deliverables really should be traceable back to the research that you've done at the start about your users and what you want from, from a business point of view, and then building on the ideas that you've sketched uh, in, your, in your generating ideas phase. OK. <coughs> so, so we've researched the problem. We've learned about our users. We've explored several designs, and now we've documented them as well. But it's now time to iterate. It's time to get feedback from stakeholders, from users, and test these ideas with real, real people and start to tweak this. This is strange, but some, some businesses may, may see this as a, some sort of failure. It's like, why didn't you get it right the first time you were a designer after all? But we all really know that design thrives on iteration. We know that our first efforts are not going to be right, and we need to accept that. And the nature of design means that if we change, change one thing, we're bound to affect other things. We need to be able to iterate and build it into our process. But there is this kind of behavioral baggage that comes with this. Sometimes it's hard for us to accept that change is necessary when we as kind of designers have invested so much of our time and effort into producing this thing. It's easy to become very overprotective about your, your ideas or your design. But for me, a bad designer will tend to cling on to these concepts for too long. And just as we did with the kind of collaborative design techniques, we need to learn when it's time to kind of let go of these things. We need to kind of adjust to this mindset, this egoless mindset. So these are, these are two designers who approach things in very different ways, apparently. Steve Jobs was commonly perceived as a, as a genius designer, a visionary, who's someone who just kind of knows what everyone wants, even though they don't know themselves. Um, there may be some truth to that, but I think it's a somewhat arrogant attitude. And in reality, Apple got many things, have got many things wrong over the time. I mean, think of something like the Newton. We don't really talk about that anymore. But they just do a very, very good job of making sure we don't hear about these things. <clears throat> so this guy on the right is one of my heroes, this guy called Christopher Alexander, who's a, as an architect. And he's a, he's a great designer too, but in a very different way. His expertise lay in the fact that he acknowledged that with so many variables on a design project, it's really unlikely or almost impossible that we can envision a perfect solution. He understood that design, and, and, in, and specifically in his case, buildings, must be adaptable in order to succeed. Buildings need to respond to the changing needs of the inhabitants over time. In short, they need to evolve. And, and, and fortunately, this approach is, is very much applicable to the web and application design. Software is soft, after all. And the option's there for us to work in a much more iterative manner, making rapid changes and tweaks, working responsively to those emerging demands of our users. And this is, this is a strong position for us to be in. So evolution is going to happen whether we choose to or not, as these kind of desire paths illustrate. I really love these things. So you can clearly see where the, the architect originally put in these kind of paved paths. And then these kind of user-generated shortcuts, people trying to find the optimum route. This is design. This is design emerging over time. And we need to be aware of these things and be able to react to them. It's something we all know what will happen. We can't really ignore it. So there's kind of two sources of information that we can turn to to help us iterate. There's, there's users and there's stakeholders, so stakeholders on the project. Now, stakeholders will often, uh, getting feedback from a stakeholder will often involve some kind of structured critique. Um, 
And this is, this is a great thing to do. Something that I know Kenneth and I both feel is missing a lot from the design process today. Um, and users can provide feedback as well in two sort of ways, really. There's the sort of quantitative feedback around things like metrics that we mentioned earlier on, um, simple things like analytics, but also sort of more advanced techniques like A-B testing, which can give us quite kind of quantitative data about how the performance of the site is, is occurring. Um, usability testing is different. It's a more of a qualitative approach. Uh, and this is what I want to even mention today. Um, so remember, at this stage of the process, all we really have is, is, a, is a, a hypothesis, really. Uh, it's really just the culmination of our design work to date. And at this stage, we really need to be asking ourselves, how do I actually know that I'm right with this? So for me, there's two types of testing. We've got summative testing, uh, which is usually something that's performed towards the end of the process. It's basically an ask covering exercise. Does this thing work? Yes, 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 yes. Um, and of course, you know, there's room for this type of testing. Any type of testing is better than none. But testing late in the process uh, means that the cost of change is, is relatively higher. You're going to have to affect change across multiple layers of that project, content, design, development, back, front end, whatever. I prefer to take a sort of more a formative route to testing. Uh, this avoids this kind of uh, expensive route by really working on the premise of test early, test often. And as the name suggests, it's designed to inform the design process. So this is a slight product pitch. I apologize for that. Um, Silverback is a tool that we created at ClearDef, but it was designed really to, to help facilitate this kind of lo-fi guerrilla usability testing. I'm sorry about the pun. Um, so it was like scratching an itch for us, really. Um, our goal was really to take usability testing, this idea of testing that's carried out in a lab with sophisticated professionals in white coats, and put it back into the hands of the people that matter, the design team. So Silverback is just a very piece of simple piece of software. It sits on your machine, captures screen activity, and we'll also use the, the inbuilt uh, EyeSight camera in a Mac to capture the, the facial activity of a user during their experience. Um, and it's a really, really cheap way to do usability testing. So you can, you know, this is $70, like the entry level kind of usability testing packages, things like Morea, sort of hundreds of dollars, maybe thousands. I think that the main message with, with testing is really keep it simple. One day of testing, one day of analysis is going to give you so much information. Um, five users is plenty. If you go over five users, you'll tend to get diminishing returns anyway. You start to see patterns. Um, so don't become distracted by trying to create the perfect usability test. It doesn't exist. Uh, and the object really is, is to improve, just not perfect the design, because that can't happen. That's impossible. Just wanted to chuck this in here. This is something that I felt has really uh, helped with usability testing recently. I've been doing a lot of cafe testing, literally taking my laptop into a cafe and testing on people on a sort of very ad hoc basis. This term right, it really basically stands, it's a, it's a buzzword. It, it stands for rapid iterative testing and evaluation. But in short, it basically means testing and then iterating between that test and the subsequent one. So I've been taking designs out, taking prototypes out, sitting with users, and maybe two or three users, and noticing kind of common errors, taking it back and presenting that to the project team, and then literally iterating and taking it back out, back out again. And that kind of rapid change has been really, really beneficial. I think it, it's worth bearing in mind that this is not easy, and it can lead to big errors, but you know it's worth exploring. <clears throat> OK, that's, that's a kind of snapshot of where UX is today. Those are the kind of bedrock parts of the process, if you like. Design research, generating ideas, detailed design and testing and iteration. But we don't just want to focus on those. We also want to think, we also want to think about what's coming up in the field and what are the opportunities that this is going to offer us. We want to mention some of the themes that, that we're kind of observing that kind of define modern or contemporary <coughs> UX. So Robert Fabricant, made, uh, he's the creative director at Frog Design. He made this kind of somewhat controversial statement at Interaction 09. He said that as interaction designers, our medium is not technology, it's behavior. That's an interesting, interesting idea. I'm not sure I entirely agree. Uh, but behavior and the idea of behavior change has certainly become a hot topic within the UX community over the last couple of years. And I think a lot of this thinking comes 
stems back to the social psychology revolution that happened in the 30s. This is Lewin's equation, which basically states that behaviour is a function of the person and his or her environment. This is not mathematics, as you can probably tell. Um, behaviour, people, environment, these are not quantifi quantifiable items, but that's not really the point. The point that Lewin was trying to make is um, people's behaviour is a function of the moment they're in. It's not just, as he previously thought, the person's past experience. And in the same vein, we have the field of behavioural economics, the term of choice architecture, which is mentioned in uh, Cass Sunstein and Richard Thaler's book, Nudge. And they talk about the way that decision-making can be deeply influenced by simply by the way that the choices are presented to us. And we're very much concerned with that as users in terms of navigation, in terms of content and the structure of our page. But in doing this, I think they make the point that it's not always the rational brain which makes these decisions. Emotions will often govern our choices, often in uncertain times. And we often end up relying on simple kind of rules of thumb, hardwired shortcuts, if you like, called, we sometimes call these cognitive bias. I'll give you an example. We know that in ambiguous situations, when people are uncertain, they often do and believe things merely because the people around them believe and do the same things. This is known as the kind of concept of social proof or herd behaviour. And for me, it's really familiar when you go to a, you know, you're in an unfamiliar place, you're on holiday, you're going out for that meal on the first night. You're never going to go in that restaurant that's got no one in it. You walk past it, but you won't go in. You're always going to go into one with someone else. We also know that humans have a bias towards attractive things, attractive things and attractive people. There's a Pennsylvania, a very famous Pennsylvania study which looked at Seven, studied 74 defendants in a court case, and it found that the good-looking ones received significantly lighter sentences. In fact, the, the, the ugly defendants were twice as likely to be imprisoned as the unattractive one. And we're just kind of scratching the surface with this stuff. This is fascinating and makes for some really interesting stories. And there's, there's you know, cognitive biases exist in their droves. They really do. And the point I'm trying to make is that they're just, unfortunately, far more prevalent than you think when it comes to humans making simple, simple decisions. So why is this important? Well, whether we like it or not, I think a lot of the work we do is about changing people's behaviour. And if we're going to achieve this, we need a stronger understanding of the psychology and the way that our users approach our products. Uh, who's here, who's familiar with the term lean or the lean movement? Okay, a few of you, yeah. Um, so this, this term was coined to describe Toyota's uh, business during the late 80s, but it's really been applied to lots of areas now, specifically the kind of startup world. So Eric Ries's book apparently is number two in the New York Times bestseller list at the moment, which that's insane for a book about startups. That just is unbelievable to me. It makes him a very wealthy man as well. Uh, very jealous. Where, where were we on the New York Times? Uh, no way. <laughs> <laughs> so the... Uh, so the central tenet of Lean is, is to kind of maximise customer value, but at the same time minimise the waste that goes into that. So from a UX perspective, obviously this is interesting because the notion of the customer or the, the user being core to the process is, is very resonant. But I think Lean has some more important lessons for us as well, more than just being user-centred. For me, it kind of offers this sort of welcome commercial context into our domain. Sometimes we miss this. They've got... You know, the lean people have feet in both the product and the startup worlds, and it kind of reminds us of the importance of thinking about the core proposition that's so important to the products we design. But sometimes we neglect these things in favour of thinking the kind of lesser attributes like visual design. You know, what is the thing that people come to this product for? So lean asks big questions like, is this, an actual, is this actually a worthwhile experience? What can our users do with this product that they couldn't do before? And how many people will actually pay for this? Will they care if it goes away? And I think Agile, the Agile development methodology, has obviously, the Agile manifesto has been hugely influential here as well. It's really an acknowledgement that this idea of doing lots of big design up front doesn't really work, and we need to think in a more sort of incremental way. They put an emphasis on working software, uh, in the same way that Lean will put an emphasis on the minimum viable product. And this gives us this kind of impetus towards delivery, which we feel is really important and sometimes missing. We now get a comfort with prototypes that don't have to be polished or pixel perfect. And they allow us to kind of really participate with our products rather than staring at you know, static Photoshop files and imagining how these things will sit when you use them in conjunction with one another. And we finally get to, to, get to experience and test these things in the, in the, 
in the context in which they'll actually be used. So let's just wrap up by looking at one or two um, directions that user experience design is, is headed. Um, one of which is, is the user experience design is becoming increasingly strategic. It's a driver of competitive advantage and a route to creating innovation. So it's very easy to copy someone else's features, right, what their service does. But it's very difficult to copy someone else's experience that they offer. And if we look, for instance, Apple are always held up as an example of this. But uh, you see lots of mobile handsets that blatantly rip off the visual design, the visual aesthetic of the iPhone and iPad. Um, but what they fail to capture is the feel of the thing, the experience that it offers. It's a much more deep and subtle thing. It's very hard to replicate. So user experience at this angle becomes less about the tactics of how do we make stuff that's easy and enjoyable to use. And it's more about what can we do to make our customers' lives better, to make products that actually give them joy. So there's this kind of adoption ladder, if you like, of maturity of user experience within businesses. Um, and that kind of builds on the pyramid that James mentioned earlier, from the kind of the functional up to the meaningful. There's a bit of a parallel here. And so at these top levels, we see organizations that are really have uh, design and user-centered thinking embedded uh, within the organization. It drives everything that they do. So design there is, is, is really about facilitation rather than dictating. It's not saying, here's the way we do it because I say so. It's saying, Everyone is a designer. Everyone participates in that. So the entire business is orientated around learning more about customers and then using the power of design to bring products to the market that help them. But that's not to say there aren't tactical challenges too, um, because, oh boy, there, there certainly are. Um, UX has a mostly web heritage, although that's, that's changing. But we all know that the web itself is changing substantially. Um, we can't think uh, of, of the web user as just a, a, a guy at a desktop. I mean, again, uh, yours is a continent that really knows that more than any. So we have the ideas of designing for mobile first or designing responsive sites that flow easily into different screen sizes and different devices. And it's not just uh, screens, it's also inputs. We've got touch screens, GPS, accelerometers, keyboards, all these different ways that people can interact with the web that we're starting to realize we've got to start designing for. So the web is being used in these new and unexpected ways. Uh, it's something that I call the wider web. Um, and I think it's a notably different future than what we've been dealing with in the past. Um, and there's also the idea of uh, user experience making its effect felt across all areas of digital business. So there's a growing focus in what's called cross-channel UX. Um, because customers interact with companies in lots of different ways. So they may use a mobile website one day. They may use a native app the next. Um, so we need to make sure as designers that the experience that people have is at least consistent or coherent between these. And it makes sense. It's all part of a larger thing but making the best use of each device. So if there's technology that's available in a mobile, how do we use that um, to really bring useful things to the customer? Just a, a, a really quick example. Um, this is a, an app called Golf Shot. I play a bit of golf, not very well. Um, this is an app that you get on the iPhone, and it allows you to um, you know, see how far you've got to hit the ball, basically. It uses you know, GPS and Google Maps. Um, and you can also record your score and how many putts you took and all this sort of thing. It also has a web component to it where you can sit in a bit more uh, relaxed environment and actually review how well you did and what are your statistical averages and have you got a big problem hitting it left on this particular hole and whatever. So each channel is really well designed for the, for the right thing. So on the course, on the mobile, you just want the things that are going to help you there and then. You know, how far have I got to hit it? What club should I use? Keeping score. But on the web, you get this detailed analysis. So the product stretches across these different channels, and it really is more than the sum of its parts. And you can extend this as well to, you know, one of those channels could be physical. So someone visiting a retail store, for instance, um, you know, is the terminology used on the website the same that's used in the, the signage in the department? So you're getting user experience people invited into those kind of planning meetings for retail uh, stores as well. And so really what we're entering is a realm of um, what's sometimes called service design. Looks at whole business processes, all those different points where uh, the business touches the customer. There's some interaction there. And it designs processes to sustain good experiences across all of those. And user experience folk are really well suited to that role. They're good negotiators. You know, we always have to stand in between lots of departments and try and sort of negotiate uh, a ceasefire between them. 
Um, and they're, they're particularly good at looking at things from first principles, right? What does the user see? And then letting everything else flow from there. So just to wrap up in the last minute or two, I think there are really two reasons why we should embrace user experience design and put people at the heart uh, of our business. The first is that, well, thankfully, it actually delivers fantastic business results. This is an experiment um, conducted by a company called Tina Lax. They're a consultancy uh, out in the States. And they invested $50,000 of real money into what they called the UX fund. And this is 10 companies that have a reputation for delivering great experiences. These aren't just tech companies. They're airlines and retailers and so on. And you'll see over the course of the year here, this index actually outperformed every other major index going, the NASDAQ, the S&P 500. It's clear that if you make things that people want, then guess what? You know, the profit tends to flow quite freely from that. But there's also a, a really important social angle to this. The social impact we can have through design is, is, is fantastic. If we can make technology more accessible, we can unlock its potential uh, to tackle some of the world's most pressing problems. And I think we'd all agree that we've got plenty of those and will continue to for the next few decades. So I recognize we have run a little bit into the break. We, we started a bit late. Um, if you have any questions, I suggest probably the best thing to do is just come and, come and talk to us face to face rather than hold you up from coffee. Um, we're going to be here all week, uh, all week, uh, how, however, how long we got? Hey, two days, all, all two days anyway. Um, so just come and find us. We'll be around and we'll happily chat about UX stuff. And thanks ever so much for your time. If you want any more information on the things we've talked about, then I do recommend a very good book um, by ourselves, which will tell you more about it. So thanks a lot.